Colleges and universities are undergoing intense pressure from a ton of angles, and their provosts are arguably at the epicenter of most of them. Hello, and welcome to a new episode of The Key, Inside Higher Ed's news and analysis podcast. I'm Doug Letterman, editor and co-founder of Inside Higher Ed and host of The Key. I really appreciate you listening. Today's episode digs into Inside Higher Ed's recently published survey of college and university chief academic officers, exploring these important officials' views on issues such as the future of tenure, cost-cutting around academic programs, and the potential impact of generative artificial intelligence. I'm joined for the discussion by my terrific Inside Higher Ed colleagues, Colleen Flaherty, who as special content editor largely developed the questions we asked and thoroughly analyzed the findings, and Ryan Quinn, the faculty issues reporter who wrote Inside Higher Ed's insightful news story about the survey. They bring to the conversation that follows their collective dozen years covering the faculty and the academic side of institutions. Before we begin, here's a word from Interfolio from Elsevier, the faculty management software, which sponsored both the survey of provosts and this episode of The Key. This episode is sponsored by Interfolio from Elsevier. Empowering scholars worldwide, Interfolio from Elsevier is an education technology company trusted by more than 500 colleges and universities across 20 countries since 1999. Visit interfolio.com to learn how Interfolio's faculty web profiles, an exciting new addition to their leading faculty information system, levels the playing field for all disciplines and enables faculty to highlight the holistic impact across their service, teaching, and research accomplishments. Now on to today's conversation with Colleen Flaherty and Ryan Quinn. Colleen and Ryan, welcome to The Key and thanks for joining us. Thanks for having us. So you both were intimately involved in our recent survey of provosts. Colleen, you led development of the survey questionnaire and produced a terrific report on the results. And Ryan, you reported and wrote a great story on the findings and their implications. So nice job all around. I'm curious if there was a single finding or theme from the survey that you found most compelling, surprising, disturbing. Colleen, why don't you jump in first? Probably because of the news, I gravitated towards our campus speech findings. So sort of first off, 27% of provosts rate the climate for open inquiry and dialogue across higher education as good or excellent. But 62% of provosts say the same about their own campus speech climate. And I know that that is like a typical dynamic in surveys, sort of the opposite of the grass is greener. But I always you know, find that very interesting when we see it in our own surveys. And then just kind of moving on to a few more findings on campus speech and probably most compellingly. 39% of provosts agree or strongly agree that current world events have stressed their institution's speech policies to the point that they may need to be revisited. And that number was closer to 20% when we asked presidents the same questions, a question a few months earlier. And I'd argue that more provosts and presidents would probably agree with the sentiment now a few because the, the survey's been live now for, for a few weeks. So our colleague Josh Moody had a story today in Inside Higher Ed about what summer will bring on campus speech policy revisions. And the gist there was that clarifications are definitely needed in some tweaks. But I'd argue that more education is needed as well as we look towards fall. So in our survey, most provosts say that their institution has taken some steps to educate students and others on campus about free speech and constructive dialogue. But the most popular one was optional, not mandatory faculty training on facilitating classroom discussions. Um, and again, just looking towards fall, um, in our survey, more than half of provosts say they're highly concerned about the 2024 election results affecting the climate for free inquiry at their institution with some differences in level of concern by age. So we've been hearing about campus speech issues for months now, you know, most acutely, but I don't think that that's going away. We'll just see a lull this summer. Just one other thing that we asked about provosts on the kind of job of being a provost. It's obviously a really tough gig right now. Um, and 39% of provosts agree strongly or somewhat that their job is more focused on financial management than on academic issues. But still 87% agree or strongly agree that they're glad that they pursued this kind of administrative work. And I think that this signals something potentially hopeful about higher ed as a whole right now, despite the many challenges it's seeing. That's interesting. Yeah. I've had so many people say to me in the last few months, can't imagine who would want to be a president. And uh, I think uh, given that the provost is uh, often, it'd be interesting if we asked them 
I don't think we asked them whether they would want to go on to be a president. They might be happy being just one rung below yes. and out of, and out of the, uh, yeah. out a little bit out of the firing line. But yeah, those are really interesting stuff. We'll come back to maybe some of those things. Uh, Ryan, what, what, uh, what jumped out at you? I think it's the amount of provosts that would actually prefer long-term contracts over tenure. There were findings that didn't seem to line up. 60% responded that tenure is very or extremely viable. Uh, half of them said it's very or extremely important to their institution's health. Yet more than half said that they favor a system of long-term contracts for tenure track and tenure faculty members over the existing tenure system. So there's both a lot of uh, feeling that the tenure is very worthwhile, yet there's also a more than 50% feeling that there should be a system of long-term contracts instead of tenure. This, this was something that one of the provosts who took um, part in our webinar on this survey also pointed out, and I do think that that's kind of a wild finding. Let's maybe dive into that one a little bit, because I think the whole question of tenure and the faculty role, I think the faculty role is in period of transformation, potential reassessment. We've certainly heard a lot about sort of all the demands being placed on faculty members that change the role significantly from probably what many of them signed up for. And I think we've seen this sort of slow erosion of tenure over the last couple of decades. And I think the, to me, the provost answers reflect a, a real split in their, in their thinking, which is both they, I think they believe in it sort of philosophically and they continue to believe that tenure represents important things. But I think they also, the reason we've seen tenure erode, good or bad, right or not, is because of the sort of increased flexibility that it offers institutions. And I think the provosts are probably, a lot of these things tie together. Provosts are thinking they, they're spending 40% of them say they're spending more time on finances. And I think that's only going to increase going forward because institutions are, most institutions are going to be facing financial strain. So I think there's both continued philosophical belief in tenure, but also a feeling that institutions may need more flexibility in how they address their programs. Colleen, I know you've thought about these issues a bunch. You have thoughts on, on that set of issues around tenure? Like Ryan, I definitely picked up on that, adopting your language, this philosophical or theoretical appreciation for tenure, how it ultimately benefits the institution, but this idea that it, more flexibility is needed or that it's not like inherently practical. At the same time, we're, you know, the faculty role is in flux and we're seeing a lot more challenges to academic freedom, which is that other important piece of tenure beyond quote unquote a job for life that tenure protects. And so, you know, tenure at this time may not be compatible with the kind of flexibility that provosts say that they need for a lot of other, you know, internal and external reasons. But I don't think that it's important, especially on the academic freedom side of things, is diminished in any way. I think that the financial pressures may be the driving force behind this. There was another finding in the survey that I think 75% of provosts said that any money for new academic programs will have to come from basically existing uh, money. Yeah. And so that shows just how much of the sample here is in a tight budget situation. Yeah. And so when you're in a tight budget situation and you are thinking that, oh, well, I'm going to have to be cutting programs or maybe I'd like a new program, but the only way I can start that up is to just move money around. Uh, you want that flexibility and yeah. tenure does get in the way of that unless you declare financial exigency is the way that you're supposed to do it through AAUP standards. Um, you're supposed to declare financial exigency uh, alongside uh, your faculty. It's supposed to be a joint decision to declare that official status before you actually begin cutting faculty members based on that. But once you declare that, it's like a big 
red flag publicly that the institution is not doing well. And so there's a hesitancy to do that. Just to jump in here, I agree that probably financial issues are the dominant pressure. But one other way, you know, that that the AAP does sort of condone tenured faculty lines being cut is through program realignments that are faculty backed. So if there is a legitimate case for a program to be sunsetted or eliminated, if the faculty is on board, that can happen without raising red flags for the institution and avoiding, you know, financial exigency. I don't think a system like a faculty senate or a faculty union would be very supportive of just going with the administration's plans to cut a program if it meant their fellow colleagues were losing their jobs. These issues really intersect and overlap. Five years ago, I probably was more thinking than I do now that it might make sense for tenure to continue to erode and that not a lot would be lost in certain ways. The threats to academic freedom that we've seen intensify, I don't think tenure is necessarily the only way Mm -hmm. to ensure academic freedom, but I sure as heck wouldn't be really eager to see tenure erode unless we can really nail other ways to do that because it sure seems like the threats to academic freedom are more serious now than they've been in quite a while. So where I tend to go on this set of issues is juggling all these interests, the the need for more flexibility. I increasingly think we need more alternatives to tenure that somehow give some institutions the more flexibility they need but they damn well also sure need to protect academic freedom. And there has certainly been work done on those models and some movement toward greater differentiation of roles and other things. And I've long thought that the issues around the sort of instructional workforce to define more broadly kind of who does what, how curriculum and is delivered, et cetera, there's a crying need for real attention to that set of issues. And we'd ideally get the best minds who are sort of representative of the faculty and people who are want institutions to continue to thrive and believe maybe in the philosophical importance of tenure to sort of address what are the ways that we can achieve these conflicting goals mm-hmm. uh, Yeah, I agree. Those are fascinating, necessary conversations. And I'd say that maybe a North Star there can be ultimately what is best for students, because certainly a lot of these just in time professor type cases, that's not good for students, that kind of employment model. You know, is there something between the most rigid definition of tenure and that, that that serves students well, and that is ethical, and that is flexible? There are great people thinking about it. And we do see some examples of experimentation there. But, you know, I think one consequence of the pandemic is that that set of issues has been put on the back burner a little bit. No, I totally agree. And I, but as the economic forces continue to intensify, the time is now. Whatever those alternatives are, I don't see how long-term contracts are it because everything in higher ed that's worth anything is is long term. Controversial research is long term. And, you know, anything that is short of a guarantee or near guarantee that your contract will be renewed just doesn't seem to do the job of protecting academic freedom. Because if if you have a long term contract of even five years, that's an opportunity at the end of five years to just be able to say, we're not going to renew your contract. We don't have to say why because your contract is up. We're not firing you. We don't have to give cause because your contract is, has expired. And that just doesn't seem to do a good job of defending academic freedom. I see a lot of institutions, a lot of faculty at institutions seemingly trying to unionize to be able to win for adjunct faculty, contingent faculty, some of those same protections that tenure would have afforded them if tenure were more of an institution today. Colleen, you wanted to bring up a couple other findings before we move on to other topics? 
just 10% of provost state teaching is much more important than research across higher ed. This is one of those ours versus theirs thing again. But 48% of provosts say that at their own institution, teaching is much more important than research. And I imagine that probably a greater number of faculty members would disagree with that, would say maybe that research is more heavily emphasized at my institution than is teaching, despite what we may say. And value. Oh, and, and yeah, value. right. Yeah. And one, one last thing here that I did, I wanted to ask you all about this, actually. So 45% of provosts agree or strongly agree that U.S. graduate programs admit too many PhD students given the current job market, with provosts at public doctoral institutions especially likely to agree. And I thought that was interesting given that public doctoral institutions tend to lean on PhD labor quite heavily, so it benefits them, you know, to in, in many places to have more PhD students around. And at the same time, there's some kind of like underlying admission here, potentially that it's it's not ethical. And I feel like that is an issue that is divisive, even among faculty, this issue of potentially capping PhD admissions, etc. So I'm curious what, what you might say about that last point. I kind of took that as an admission from provosts that while these uh, students may be good to have at the university for revenue purposes and vitality of department purposes. We are producing too many PhDs for the actual academic job market and maybe for the professional job market as well. To me, that's recognition that provosts have ethics. And I've had people explain to me why that would be a bad idea. And I certainly wouldn't, I think it would be a bad idea for them to be capped by anybody but the programs themselves because we want institutions to make their own decisions, but I think it has been irresponsible in certain ways for institutions to keep cranking out, even if it's good for them to have low paid labor to teach a lot of classroom sections. This episode is sponsored by Interfolio from Elsevier. Empowering scholars worldwide, Interfolio from Elsevier is an education technology company trusted by more than 500 colleges and universities across 20 countries since 1999. Visit interfolio.com to learn how Interfolio's faculty web profiles, an exciting new addition to their leading faculty information system, levels the playing field for all disciplines and enables faculty to highlight the holistic impact across their service, teaching, and research accomplishments. This episode of The Key features a conversation with my colleagues Colleen Flaherty and Ryan Quinn about Inside Higher Ed's recent survey of chief academic officers. We'll turn now to some of the results around generative artificial intelligence. I think we should talk a little bit about AI because I think that not only did we ask a set of questions about that for the first time in this year's survey, but it's been coming up in a lot of conversations I've been having with academic leaders and others. But I'm curious what you found most compelling in the AI section. And I'm, it seemed as if we were sort of beginning to move past the ex- almost exclusive focus that we were seeing a year ago on all our students are going to be cheating. We have to stop use of this. Um, but I'm curious what you viewed there. Colleen, maybe start with you again. From this survey and a lot of other work we've been doing in the last few months at Inside Higher Ed, I'd say we are definitely moving past or past the cheating as dominant concern phase. As for what phase we're currently in, I think we're still in like a use case phase, though. For example, in our survey, Provost's top reported use of AI is chatbots, with about 45% saying they're in play at their institution, which is not huge. I mean, given that that's like a basic application of AI. And then the use case percentages just go down from there. At the same time, we know, of course, with some institutions, perhaps most obviously Arizona State, due to its partnership with OpenAI, some are looking ahead towards a more enterprise-based approach. And then 20% of provosts say their institution has published a policy or policies governing the use of AI, including in, in teaching and research with those at private baccalaureate institutions and public doctoral institutions, more likely than other peers to say so. 
But most remaining provosts do say that such a policy is under development. And then nearly all provosts surveyed say faculty and staff members at their institution have asked for additional training related to developments in Gen AI. And 78% say that their institution has offered this kind of training. So there's, you know, a responsiveness or alignment there. As for the curriculum, though, which we know is really important to students from some of our other survey work, students expect and want to be trained for the workforce on AI in terms of ethical and practical applications. Just 14% of provosts say their institution has reviewed the curriculum to ensure that it will prepare students for the rise of AI in the workplace. Now, this is certainly a moving target, and I think Ryan can talk a little bit more about that based on his conversations with provosts. And curricular changes, of course, take time. But again, it just really de- uh, demonstrates a lack of alignment with student expectations there. Mm-hmm. Overall, one last thing I'll throw in here is that most provosts are concerned to some degree about the risk generative AI, Doug, to kind of your initial point, poses to academic integrity with the plurality 47% being moderately concerned and older provosts expressing the most concern by age. But at the same time, most provosts are at least somewhat enthusiastic about AI's potential to boost their institution's capabilities. Just 2% are not at all enthusiastic. Ryan, anything jump out at you in this realm? If we're past the fear stage or the exclusively fear stage, maybe we're in the, okay, maybe a little less afraid, but not knowing quite what to do or what to make of AI at this point, which I I think is, is a fair position to be in considering it's hard to gauge how powerful AI will be, you know, next year. Are even sooner or than next that. week, right? Or next I mean, week, yeah, yes. exactly. So, what used to look like a um, gimmicky technology is is increasingly more and more powerful and useful. The fourteen percent of provosts, the one in seven, saying that their colleges or universities had reviewed uh, the curriculum to ensure it will prepare students for AI in their careers. Only fourteen percent is quite concerning there, <laughs> and maybe it's because they don't know how to even conduct such a review. Maybe they're saying to themselves, how am I supposed to know how to prepare students for using AI in their careers when AI is going to be changing the careers that they're going to have or maybe eliminating their careers? So maybe this is just not something that can be done. But that just seems to be a very small fraction of provosts whose institutions have undergone that review. The the provost I spoke with, they were talking about the need to not have our head in the sand, to not be afraid, exclusively afraid of AI, or just to try to kick it out of our classrooms completely because we're afraid about students cheating. They talked about the need to actually meet it head on and try to integrate it into education in whatever way that looks like, even though these provosts, one one in particular said that he thinks that a, a good approach to a policy on AI is leaving flexibility for faculty members individually on how they actually want to incorporate it or not incorporate it into their classrooms. And I think that makes sense because you have to be flexible with a changing, evolving technology like this. The part that I think we didn't address a lot in the survey, but I think we're definitely starting to see, is the thinking about whether and how Gen AI may change the faculty role. And and going back to what we were talking about before, you know, the big promise of Gen AI broadly is that it allows different people in their jobs to shed maybe some of the stuff that is least engaging, least compelling, least challenging, least human facing to create more room for the stuff that you'd like to think people want to really spend their time on. One of the conversations I had this week, a provost, this was a provost in her scholarly capacity. She was writing a book and she had written a chapter and she had put in the Word doc or whatever she was writing in, just next to everything she wanted to cite, she had put maybe in parentheses, I don't have all the details, but an author and maybe a word that represented the book title or something. And then she plugged that chapter into Claude, which is one of the AI tools, and it 
in two minutes basically produced all the footnotes. And she said that would have been six, eight hours of work. She was excited by that as a as a scholar. But I think all the questions around what parts of the faculty job can AI pick up? Are they things that are that that faculty members truly can get help with and that it helps them focus on other things? Obviously, that tends to lead to questions about, well, if we can do this set of things and maybe we don't need as many of this and that. I think that's more likely to be true in other parts of the institution than on the faculty side. I think there are I think there are leaders out there who are looking at how AI might allow them to to get by with fewer people. I don't think that's really going to be the direction things head with the faculty members, but I do think that's a fear that probably faculty members have, and it's not a crazy one. But I think that's a set of conversations that I think is ahead and going to be interesting, at least. What I can say most generally about that right now is that... I think with a lot of this enthusiasm for AI, there are some, and I would say maybe it's more (laughs) fringe views that this is an opportunity to cut staff and save costs and, you know, reduce our our human expenses. And and I would just say that that is not where the main conversations about the the benefits of AI are are headed. I mean, this is the, the through line that I see in you know the hype around ai and higher education it is is it is that is going to free up humans faculty members etc to do more of that essential human work that really drew students to the institution and employees to the institution in the first place ai is not a replacement for the human element in education it is a supplement it is an assist it's a way to do it better you know, as people are thinking about policies and things like that, I mean, I think that that should be an important guiding principle. 100%. I think that is the vision that the positive vision is that it gets rid of scut work that we all have or limits it and enables it to be done faster and leaving more time for the fun stuff, the rewarding stuff, the stuff that especially helps students. There's just understandable skepticism that in the wrong hands can uh, go awry. But Ryan, you want to jump in? I heard at a, the MLA conference, there was an AI panel where they were talking about how there is sometimes hypocrisy when it comes to AI. How can you say to your students, you can't write an assignment with AI you can't write an, an essay or something with AI, and yet you as a faculty member are writing an assignment using AI. Because uh, apparently, you know, this this is one of the uses that faculty members have wanted to put AI to, is writing those in-class, throwaway daily assignments. And the need to have some sort of clarity on what is essentially plagiarism from AI and what's not, and what's allowable and what's not. And then, yeah, the, the the question about what is it going to to cause job losses? Again, I don't think it's going to cause job losses for faculty members so much. Maybe I'd be worried if I really wanted to hold on to a TA position or just a pure grading papers position. Those, I think, would be the positions that we'd be more worried about losing. But even that, I just think that AI is changing so rapidly that we just don't know at this point. That's a wrap on a conversation with my inside higher ed colleagues, Ryan Quinn, who you just heard from, and Colleen Flaherty. Thanks to them both for their time and insights, and to Interfolio from Elsevier for sponsoring this episode of The Key. We covered a lot of ground and could have talked for hours, as the survey covered a ton of issues beyond those we explored in the confines of this podcast discussion. Diversity, equity, and inclusion, employee and student mental health, and a lot more on campus speech, among other topics. If you have some time, I'd encourage you to check out Ryan's story and the full results on our website. I wanted to call out one little data point from the survey and from our conversation that bears repeating. Colleen noted that a full 87% of provosts we surveyed said that despite all the problems they and their institutions were facing, they're still glad they pursued administrative work. It's easy right now to focus on the negative, 
on the increasing regularity of campus closures, the pounding college and university leaders are taking from politicians, and the growing public questioning about the value of degrees. But as another traditional academic year comes to a close, arguably the toughest academic year I can remember, it's heartening to know that the vast majority of people in perhaps the most pressure-filled position on a lot of college campuses still find their work rewarding and worth doing. Thanks to them and to all of you, staff and faculty members who make your institutions tick and keep your students learning and your research labs cranking and your facilities air conditioned and the bills paid. Wishing all of you a good start to the summer and until next time, stay well and stay safe.